All right, guys, here we are, Martin Luther King Day weekend. We're going to do a, a quick, you can step out. Um, we're going to do a quick recap of um, the high middle ages. A um, lot to cover, small time, a long way to go, and a short time to get there, in the words of the great Jerry Reed. We're, we're into the high middle ages. It's at this point where everything that we have been studying is going to come together as the world gets more interconnected than ever before. Um, new towns and cities are going to emerge as we're going to leave the old feudal past behind and move into a new distinct future. And it is during the Middle Ages that a couple things are going to pop up. Number one, separate monarchies are going to develop specifically in England and France and to a lesser extent in Germany. But one of the big things that we get out of the High Middle Ages is the massive confrontation between emperors and popes, specifically Pope Innocent III and all the other um, heads of state. But before that, we're going to deal with a very complicated process of lay investiture. Pope Gregory VII was a strong man of Gregorian tradition and church reform. And one of the practices that had been going on was where a lay person or a non-religious person was creating high church offices, bishops and archbishops, in a sense giving their buddies a job, a cushy job, to help give them greater political control. Pope Gregory said you cannot do this. Only he, only the Pope can do that. The church is off limits from governmental control. Gregory felt that this was a corrupting influence. The church was being deviated from its true spiritual mission. The powerful monastery in Cluny, France, felt the same way. They followed old St. Benedict's ideas, all right, the Benedictine order, and that the church must maintain its spiritual focus. So Gregory says you cannot work for God and man at the same time. You can't have two masters. And so all of this will come to um, a head. Um, Gregory will put church independence to the test where he does not, he will not follow the subservience of the church to any political authority. And he condemns under excommunication the process of lay investiture. That means you will be kicked out of the church. You cannot receive the sacraments. And if you can't do that at the time, you couldn't get to heaven. This is one of the big pieces of ammunition that the church maintains. So, now... King Henry, over the Holy Roman Empire, thought this was a slap in his face, a jolt to his royal authority. You cannot tell me to do that. And Gregory says, well, yes, I can. And so Henry rejects this and chooses his own pope, a, a new pope. And so instantly, Gregory excommunicates him. And Henry calls all of his loyal bishops to a place in Worms to declare their allegiance to him where they are hammered. They are excommunicated. Now the people who really enjoy this are the 360 German princes who, while Henry and the Pope are dueling, are able to assert their independence. Well, Gregory will go to his retreat in the Alps. He will make Henry stand outside in the snow for three days begging his forgiveness, and the Pope wins. In 1122, the Concordat of Worms is signed. It will forever end the practice of lay investiture. What it says, the emperor can be present when the church creates um, a bishop or an archbishop. But then these, these bishops can be given a fief. They can be given a title after the church chooses them, not before, showing the church and God is primary. So, 1122, the process, process of lay investiture. While Gregory wins and the papacy is stronger than ever, it is the German princes who win out, and it will take hundreds of years for Germany to be reunified. 
Next big event is the Crusades. It is the high point of power for the Roman Catholic Pope. As Urban II is the current Pope, when in 1090, the Byzantine Emperor asks him for his help. The Muslim Turks were besieging Constantinople, and after years of trying to kill the Pope and get rid of the Pope, Emperor Commodus is forced to ask for help. Pope Urban II responds by calling upon the First Crusade. Let's get the European knights out of Europe. Let's stop them from fighting each other and damaging the peasants. They are all Christians. Let's go down to the Holy Land and combat the Muslims. So thousands of knights will leave destined for the Holy Land. Urban II has two goals, to hopefully reunify the church and once again get the feuding knights out of Europe. The result of the Crusades are wide-reaching. Militarily, it is the only successful crusade. Jerusalem is liberated. However, as soon as the Crusaders leave, the Islamic armies come right back. There are many Crusades, eight or nine of them. The first is the only successful one. The one that gets the most attention is the third, um, because of King Richard the Lionheart and the Islamic war leader Saladin, which we'll get to in a second. However, the behavior of the barbaric European knights is so bad to the cultured Byzantines, all hope of reunifying the churches is forever lost. So, one thing that the Crusades do is for the first time in 600 years, People leave Western Europe. They get out and they find out that while they were in the Dark Ages, stewing as I call it, other parts of the world had not only maintained Greco-Roman learning, but advancements were made in art, in science, and technology. For the first time, people in Western Europe have access to that. Spices coming out of India will actually make food taste good. Science, medicine, all of that begins to come back. And that kickstarts a rebirth in the economy. Feudal peasants who at one time had no choice but to labor all day for a lord, some of the braver ones risked everything. If they make one trip down to the Middle East and back, they can become rich. The money that they bring in allows them to create new towns, to set up businesses where they are selling wares that everybody wants. Savvy kings will begin to charter towns, allow people to, to, to live in them. They are going to make money. The king will take a percentage of that. With that money, he can have enough cash to hire a standing army, and he no longer needs his nobles. <coughs> Excuse me. Along with the towns, we get a concentration of educated people, so education makes a re-entrance as the first cathedral schools and later universities are created and higher education is brought back to Europe. So things are changing. Up in northern France, we have William the Conqueror. All right? William was the illegitimate son of the Duke of Normandy. And when the Duke of Normandy dies, when William is at a very young age, um, he has to go into hiding. When he comes back, he is not only trained militarily, but big physically, and he will go after the knights that, that killed his uncle and his father's loyal knights and claim the throne, the title of the Duke of Normandy. Now, his grandmother was an English royal, and when the king dies, William is the, only, is the closest male direct blood descendant of the English throne. He expects to be named king, but because he's illegitimate, the British skip him. And they name, name a guy, Harold Godwinson, as the new king of England. William is tired of being beaten up for his illegitimacy, so he takes his army over to England, and he wins the Battle of Hastings 20 years later. Um, and he goes to Westminster Abbey, where he is crowned king of England. This sets up a host of problems because since William is technically the Duke of Normandy, a vassal to the French king, the king of France 
Actually, the king of England is a vassal to the king of France. And that's not going to play out very well. But England turns out to be a pretty good ruler. Number one, he uses writs or legal warnings. You continue to do this, and there's going to, this is going to be the punishment. I'm warning you, keep this up, and there's going to be a problem. And he begins the, the policy of parlaying, going out to his nobles and listening to them. He doesn't have to do what they say, but just the ability to speak freely to your king is powerful to these men. And last but not least, he creates his census called the Doomsday Book to get an accurate count of population and production. Areas that consume more resources are going to pay more taxes. And the big saying is, it was easier to escape doomsday than, um, than it was easier to escape death than William's Doomsday Book, excuse me. Shortly after that, during the Third Crusade, um, we have a new king after William named Henry, who becomes more oppressive and cruel to the people of England. Eventually, we get to the famous Prince John and Richard Lionheart of the Robin Hood legend, and while Richard is down in the Holy Land on crusade, his brother John is a massive screw-up. Number one, he charges heavier taxes. Number two, um, he... Can you check on that, Bethany? Number two, he... Uh, increases not only taxes, sorry there was a brief um, interruption here folks <clears throat> and he picks a fight with the Pope over the Archbishop of Canterbury, sorry I'm recording yeah. All right. he charges um, he gets into a fight with the Pope over um, the Archbishop of, of Canterbury when it's all said and done John winds up being excommunicated, and England is placed under interdict. On top of that, John loses a war with the French. And so his nobles hunt him down, they knock him off his horse, and create the Magna Carta, or Great Charter, which forever binds the English king to the will of Parliament. Now no one is above the law. So... Um, that is going on in England. When the English king sees his power being controlled by the nobles, the French king is a, a different story. In France, the king will emerge as dominant. Which brings us to Pope Innocent III, who will be the high point, the pinnacle of papal power. Um, during a vacated throne in the Holy Roman Empire, there will be several contenders for the throne. Inside of Germany, they're fighting, and England and France, who are becoming modern nation states, begin to back different members. At times, all of them anger Pope Innocent III, and the rightful heir to the throne, Frederick II, does as well. So Innocent III will, at different times, excommunicate all different royal heads of state. When the high middle ages is over, Innocent III wins. He is able to subjugate and buckle heads of state to the church will. A, a separation of church and state is maintained. But the church is about to experience its next big problem as the Black Plague is on the way. But during the High Middle Ages, modern nation-states are built. Trade and cultural diffusion are going to come as a result of the Crusades. Towns are, are shaped, and different modes of governing and ruling are finally created. On the horizon comes the Renaissance and the Black Death. That is a very quick summary of the high points of the High Middle Ages. So, have any questions, you guys know where I'm at. I'll see you next week.